Hi, everybody, and welcome to our webinar, What We Breathe, What We Feel, Designing Homes for Optimal Indoor Environmental Quality, which Fine Home Building is hosting in partnership with Mitsubishi Electric Train HVAC US. My name is Justin Fink from Fine Home Building, and I'm going to be your host for today's webinar. Uh, let's meet our two presenters from Mitsubishi. We have Chad Gillespie. Say hi, Chad. Hi, what's going on, Justin? And Kimberly Llewellyn. Say hi, Kimberly. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Now, real quick before we get started, there's just two bits of housekeeping I want to go over. Uh, first and foremost, the biggest question we get is whether a recording of this webinar will be made available to attendees. Rest assured that a link to the video will be sent to you automatically via your registered email address, so you don't need to worry about taking notes. Secondly, there's going to be a live Q&A after the presentation, which you can access and participate in while Chad and Kimberly are running through their slides. Uh, you can post those questions using the questions tab, which should be on the toolbar in the right side of your screen. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Chad to get us started. Great. Thank you, Justin. Well, welcome, everybody, to the webinar. Uh, we chose this topic uh, to really look at what I think a lot of people are experiencing now more than they probably did before COVID-19. And it's pretty important that we look at the indoor environmental quality. We always talk a lot about AQ, uh, indoor air quality, but I think we really need to look at the whole house and understand how it works, how we design for the best IEQ and why it's important. Uh, as more people are home, uh, a lot more they have been in the past. Not only are people changing their habits, retrofitting their houses, but builders are now looking at how they might need to change how they build for the future. Uh, so today, we know we, uh, Kimberly and I have some, some fun topics to talk about. And again, there will be a point at the end that we can answer questions. So we're looking forward to some really interesting uh, questions for us. Um, but we'll get started. Our, our objectives today are really to educate builders, designers, consumers uh, on IEQ and, and really why it's important. HVAC systems are a really important uh, aspect of this. Uh, certainly the therm the envelope of the house, uh, there's a lot of other factors in there, but today we're really going to talk about HVAC and mechanical systems and really how we can improve IEQ. So really, I guess the first thing is, is what is IEQ? Most people have heard of IAQ, but it really has is, is gone past just what the air quality is. Uh, there's been a lot of studies to show not only IEQ for homes, but for businesses and offices on really how people react to certain uh, environmental aspects of their office or their house and it's really it's really interesting to see how well people can perform or how happy they are or or just the opposite how miserable they feel if their IEQ is is really not it's not that great so we really want to talk about you know what the factors are that go into this and, and here are kind of the four core and of course indoor air quality is at the top but really thermal comfort is is definitely a major one that we talk about and there's lots of aspects that really go into comfort. Uh, a lot of people just think you set your thermostat at 72 or 75 and then you're comfortable, but there are lots of factors and lots of ways to achieve personal comfort. Of course, lighting and how that affects people's mood, uh, their productivity, and of course, sound. Um, I'm sure most people here that have been working from home have really had some interesting webinars and phone calls with kids or animals running around their house when there is loud machinery or loud blowing you know hvac systems and again that to be like loud like a door slamming it just is something constant that really can affect the productivity of people and their overall happiness so so again these are all things that we talk about uh, mostly we're going to talk about the top three but certainly iq thermal comfort and sound i guess the first thing we look at is when we talk about iq is it is certainly is occupant specific you know there are many people that like their house very cold and there's plenty of people who like their house very warm. What we have to look at is, you know, how people uh, live and what their expectations are of comfort. So I think that's one of the first things that we look at when designing for our houses, even for our HVAC contractors, when they're doing uh, a retrofit change out, they really need to understand what the client is looking for. You know, some want a really cold bedroom, uh, some want less humidity, some want better I, you know, IEQ because they feel like the, it's moldy or it's uh, dusty and it's causing allergy and problems that you know, are affecting the household. So I think the big thing is understanding that not everyone wants the same thing. And again, health requirements, if you have someone who has allergies uh, or has any type of, of lung distress, you know, these are things that really need to be recognized and addressed, um, whether it's an HVAC contractor, builder, or designer. So when we talk about thermal comfort, it, you know, one of the biggest things that we look at 
is the sensible uh, temperature. So if you set it to 72, that's what you feel. Now, the other side of that is the humidity side, the latent side. And that is really where, you know, people have this misconception about how it affects their, their, how they feel and the temperature of their house. So if you have a very uh, dry house, you could set your temperature in the summer a few degrees higher and feel absolutely every bit as comfortable versus you would, in, in a humid uh, indoor environment, you would definitely need to dr bring that temperature down uh, colder, but you know what? You're never gonna feel really comfortable because it's almost like a wet cool. And so that's why really making sure the humidity level is good. Um, but one other thing that is not really looked upon uh, by most of our HVAC contractors that we talk to and, and even designers and builders uh, is mean radiant temperature. And that is a combination of factors that are really gives you what you feel. That's the actual mean radiant temperature. So we'll, we'll go into that a little more and Kimberly will help address that. Air stra stratification, if your air is, is basically stratified where the cold air is at the, at the bottom of your room and high air is stuck at the top, again, you'll have comfort areas that are good and then some that are really bad. So we really need to move that air and keep it uh, destratified. And air velocity, and this is another one. It's not always great when you have an air conditioning unit that's blowing air, which feels like you're coming out the back of a jet. It's really, if you can keep a very uh, moderate uh, velocity or a, a slow velocity of air consistently, you probably will have more comfort. So again, we can really talk a little bit more about this. And if anyone has any specific questions, please uh, ask on the uh, webinar. So IQ is very important. You know, this is a big thing that we are starting to realize that it's not just uh, the outside air. It's certainly it's the inside air that has contaminants. And, and the more we see uh, there is a lot of production of, of, of contaminants produced in the indoors. So we'll address that as well. And again, we kind of talked about sound factors, but the, this is important to address. And certainly with our, you know, our new equipment is very quiet indoors and outdoors. We, we certainly can address that. I think that what we start to realize even before COVID, but definitely now with COVID, is that people have a really high interest in their indoor air quality and IEQ as well. So for designers and builders and HVAC, HVAC contractors, this is some, something important to consider. Millennials are certainly more aware of their IAQ. They are more likely to research this or look at, at, at IAQ when they're looking to new homes or buying an existing home. So again, these are real, just more supporting factors we've, uh, that we looked at to, that really bolster this idea that we have to do a better job in designing our houses and uh, with HVAC and air quality products. One of the things that's going to really help, we think, to get this into the mainstream is the growth of high-performance construction. And high-performance construction is, is what we define as anything that's above code level. Our code-built houses are pretty good, uh, but they're definitely levels above that. Um, zero energy ready homes from the Department of Energy, that's a level that you can reach that uh, is energy efficient, has better air quality uh, products involved or required, and then all the way to Passive House. And Passive House is probably the most stringent program that is mainstream, and the growth of Passive House is phenomenal. So again, looking at how we build with more efficient uh, insulation, much tighter houses, we really have to think about the, the HVAC system and the mechanical components much differently than we did 15 years ago or even 10 years ago, uh, and maybe even five years ago. If houses are built tighter, so they leak less, which is a great thing, you really do have to consider introducing fresh air or exhausting contaminants. This is the code requirements. This is the international or IECC code. As you can see, this is the energy use intensity, and it basically is, is showing how much more efficient the requirements are for a code-built house. So you can see that it's, since 2006, it has become a lot more efficient for your average code-built house. And again, with that comes a much different mechanical design. And again, we have to really address that um, for new houses. Uh, but we still have to pay attention to existing houses. Um, so kind of to summarize this section, there are lots of components that go into a healthy and comfortable home. Again, the envelopes are very important. Obviously, all of the pieces that we, we talk about, the, the basic stuff, low VOC products inside the house. There's lots of different components. But again, today we're focusing more on the HVAC and mechanical side. So with that, I'm going to pass this over to Kimberly and let her work on kind of the basics of comfort fundamentals. So Kimberly, you want to take it away? Thanks, Chad. Comfort is a subjective experience, which means that comfort means something different to everyone. There are some similarities and there are some 
comfort ranges that we can more or less fit into, which is probably where we got our interior design um, condition targets of say 75 degrees dry bulb and 50% RH for our cooling season. So we have, you know, we have general targets that make most people more or less comfortable, but, um, but there are things that are um, well outside of um, the control of either building envelope or HVAC systems like metabolism and clothing choices and even, you know, where you were raised and what you're acclimated to um, that affect a person's subjective experience of comfort. Those things are not within our grasp to really influence, but there are factors which we can influence. And in order to influence them in a meaningful and positive way, we need to understand what those factors are about a little bit better. So in that spirit, we are going to start with a building envelope. And sometimes that seems a little bit counterintuitive to folks to hear uh, you know, a team like, like ours working for an HVAC manufacturer say that. However, we understand that fundamentally there's only so much that an HVAC system can do to fight a poor performing building envelope. So the two main factors that we'll discuss that have to do with the envelope I have to do with surface temperatures generally. So mean radiant temperatures, thermal bridgings related, those fall into one category. Another really important aspect that people don't always think about has to do with infiltration and ventilation. So the details of a building envelope, the choices that we make in our building materials and how we put those materials together in our building assemblies can have huge impacts so let's talk first about ventilation and infiltrations. Ventilation and infiltration, it's all about air movement through a building envelope and within uh, the building space itself. Infiltration is uncontrolled air coming into a house, into a home, into a building. Um, exfiltration is the reverse of that. So, you know, sometimes depending on what the pressure differentials are between inside and outside, you may have air coming in or you may have air going out. So infiltration is that uncontrolled movement of air in our building. So if you don't know that already, that's a danger. If we can't control air coming in and out of our houses, then we can't do a lot about it. And that's the reason that the detailing of our air control air is so very important. You know, I'm not sure how widely understood the impacts of those infiltration loads are understood. Equally un misunderstood, I think, are the impacts of our ventilation load. So once we say ventilation instead of um, infiltration, we're introducing the possibility of controlling air that is coming into our house. So the tighter we're building envelopes, the more we're becoming aware of the need to introduce air intentionally into homes in order to dilute um, contaminant concentrations and in order to eliminate contaminants. So ventilation by comparison to infiltration allows us the possibility of controlling the air movement into our homes. So this is potentially a good thing, but in order to have more intentional mechanical designs that um, allow us to improve comfort and health within our buildings, we need to understand the nature of those loads, whether they're intentional or not. One other thing I'd like to mention about ventilation, um, because I want to make sure folks are aware of this, it's not a requirement either by code or even by many building programs to have uh, supply ventilation air. Um, so even to be 622 compliant um, or IECC, IMC, IRC ventilation requirement compliant, um, exhaust only is the an acceptable option, at least in theory. But when we're talking about wanting to maintain control, better control over interior conditions, that is a ventilation strategy that we're going to want to be very cautious with. More to come on that topic. So the second law of thermodynamics is near and dear to my heart and always, you know, 
close to the front of my brain um, because it, it influences so many things in our lives and especially comfort. So when we think about our, our experience within our built environment, you know, the whole purpose of, of shelter is to make the conditions inside that shelter different when we want than the conditions we're experiencing outside. And so we create shells within which we live and those shells are controlling, restricting, resisting heat flows in one direction or the other, depending on which season we're in. Um, and think goodness, there are um, immutable laws which we can count on, you know, in, in our crazy times. We know that just like gravity will not fail us, um, neither will the second law of thermodynamics. So the simple way to put this is that hot moves to cold, wet moves to dry, and high pressure air volumes will, will look to equalize themselves. So if you have two rooms or two spaces that have one at a higher pressure and one at a lower, you will have a, a flow of air from that area of higher pressure to the area of lower pressure. So basically, most systems look to balance themselves. And that's a simple way to think about the dynamics that are going on within your homes in terms of moisture transport, in terms of heat movement, and in terms of air movement. So let's talk about the heat movement a little bit more. So thermal bridging has a huge impact on thermal comfort, not to mention energy, heat loss, and gain in our buildings. So all of what we're talking about in terms of comfort is necessarily tied to energy efficiency. So when we discuss high performance homes or buildings as we are now, it's like a gem that has different facets. It's the same gem, but we can turn that gem around to look at a different facet and describe it in a different way. So right now we're talking about comfort, but all of the factors that impact comfort, like a high-performing air control layer, high-performing thermal control layer, good ventilation, all of these factors also impact the energy efficiency. So getting back to thermal bridging, thermal bridging describes the elements within a building envelope that allow for easy heat transfer. So as you're seeing continuous insulation work its way into energy code, the reason for that is that you know, a continuous layer of insulation effectively breaks a lot of the thermal bridging that we would otherwise have in a traditionally framed and detailed house. So what you're looking at in that photo right there is, you know, the clearly in heating season, so it's cold outside and warm inside, and the framing members that are yellow are acting as thermal bridges. They're allowing for plenty of heat to transfer through those framing elements because wood is, it's not the worst heat resistor. Um, it has an R value of something like one per inch. It's not the worst, but it's certainly much more thermally conductive than insulation. But in terms of comfort, thermal bridging also impacts interior surface temperature, which describes an average temperature of the surfaces in a given space. Again, that's one of the factors that uh, because maybe less tangible, we don't fully acknowledge the very strong impact that radiative heat transfer has, not just on comfort, but again, on energy efficiency and, and other things. But, you know, we're familiar with conduction as a method of heat transfer, was heat moves through objects. And we're familiar with convective heat transfer as heat moves through the medium of air, but we don't think as much about heat transfer from surface to surface. And this mean radiant temperature helps us start getting a more visceral sense of better way to describe what the, what the impacts of surface temperatures can be on, on comfort. So I'm going to describe this really, really fantastic tool. It was developed by the Center for the Built Environment. And this thermal comfort tool essentially mechanizes, automizes, um, automates 
uh, ASHRAE standard, comfort standard 55, which describes comfort as a subjective experience. And what you're looking at here in this slide is this blue band is that band that describes conditions under which most people will be comfortable. So not everybody, but most people, if our dot, which is describing our operative interior dry bulb temperature and our humidity ratio. If that dot falls within that band, then most people will be comfortable. What that band takes into account is all of these factors, which the ASHRAE standard 55 have determined are the factors that most impact most people's experience of comfort. So if you look down here, we've got our operative temperature, which would just be our average dry bulb temperature in the room. Airspeed, so as Chad mentioned, you know, it's a totally different experience that we have in a room that with totally still air versus a room where there is some air movement. Too much air movement, as if you're coming out of the back of a jet, is not comfortable. But equally uncomfortable is totally still air. So the air movement, that feet per minute factor is important. Um, relative humidity is also very important. And, and then those last two factors, metabolic rate and clothing level, are some of the subjective elements that I mentioned before. So that blue band again, it, it takes all of these five factors into account and that's what it's, it's basically describing. So as we adjust those factors, that blue band moves around and changing a factor like mean radiant temperature would move that band to the left, which means that folks would fall out of that comfort range more readily because that impact from heat transfer from the surface of the room that we're in to our skin is actually quite impactful. So I think most people are fairly aware of the fact that you can be comfortable at a higher temperature when it is drier. So desert heat is easier to take for most of us than um, humid heat. So as a general rule, and most design criteria will uh, reflect this general rule, that we, we like as humans generally to keep relative humidity between 40 and 60%, but below 40%, it, you know, we can equally run into health and comfort impacts because our respiratory system is tends to be healthier when we there's enough moisture in the air. And that is not a fixed number or value. It's different for everyone, but the general band that most people need to be comfortable, um, again, is in that 40 to 60% range. Now, you know, I'll acknowledge that our Heating design criteria is actually at 30% and so, so lower and 70 degrees dry bulb for most projects, for residential projects. But that is, you know, I think that that's a balance between practicality and an ideal RH simply because it's hard to maintain higher temperatures when it's cold and dry outside. So with that, Chad, I'm going to hand control back over to you. Thank you, Kimberly. And that was a great job on really getting into the science of IEQ. And, and these are some of the things that our designers and our HVAC contractors and builders really have to consider. And what we realize over the years uh, as a company, how many hot spots and cold spots and comfort issues there are in existing housing. And when Mitsubishi started you know, over 30 years ago in the United States, that was his primary function, uh, was really to address hot spots and cold spots. And, you know, it, there's a lot of science to it. And as we design tighter houses, uh, if it's not done well, we'll see even more comfort complaints or health issues. But again, there's so much good science out there and you know, tools that she's shown that designers and HVAC contractors can use uh, to really get it right. So, so thanks, Kimberly. Uh, we're going to talk about heat pumps and how, a little bit how they work and how you can design with these. As a really quick brief, Heat pumps come in lots of configurations, which we'll show. Uh, this diagram shows an, a, a ductless unit that many people are familiar with. Heat pumps work by extracting heat from one place in 
taking this one to another. So when we're in heating mode, you can see at the top of the diagram, the indoor air, which is blue, representing cold air coming into the unit. That's the return air. And as it comes out of the unit, it's producing warm air. How that works is that what we are doing here is taking the energy out of that cold air, uh, which is in blue, and taking it back outside to the outdoor unit. And what we're doing is we're extracting heat from the outdoors. Now, even though the outdoors is cold, we can still, because of how the compressor works in the outdoor unit, extract heat even though it's cold, even down to negative 13 uh, degrees outside or even colder temperatures in some of our light commercial commercial units. So we extract that heat from the outdoors and then it runs through the refrigerant line, which is in red, and goes back into the coil, it heats the coil up, and then discharges warm air. So that's a constant process that's going on. You know, again, this, this unit is both for heating and cooling. So you basically reverse this process and you would get cooling. And the technology keeps getting better and better, so we're more and more efficient. When a lot of people think, so, think of heat pumps, especially anyone you know, probably 50 or older, they remember when the first heat pumps came out. And when they were discharging air in, say, heating mode, the temperature was not that warm. Um, so if you're discharging 90-degree air, which is definitely going to heat up your, your indoor space uh, and make it warmer, but when you put your 98 degree temperature skin up against it, it felt cool. And so a lot of people had complaints that you wouldn't feel comfortable with a heat pump. That was some of the original complaints. With the newer heat pumps, especially we have a hyperheat version, but all of our versions have a, a very warm discharge. Uh, we have had heat pumps, even in cold temperatures, discharge air at 140 degrees. So it's definitely warmer. So we, we don't really see those kind of same comfort complaints that heat pumps used to have, you know, 20 years ago. So as far as options for heat pumps, I think this is probably another misconception about, especially when we talk about variable speed, mini splits or, or mini split heat pumps, is that they're just, there's one version and that's the white, you know, plastic box on the wall. And even though, yes, that's one of our best sellers, variable speed heat pumps come in a lot of configurations. And, and I think that's why really we're seeing more builders and contractors move towards this technology is because there's more options out there for them for all situations. So when we look at these different product types, we can start at the top left and, and what you'll see there is the three gray vertical air hammers. These are built just like your traditional uh, units you might have in your house. These are your traditional size. Um, they can do a whole house. They uh, have lots of static pressure so they can push a lot of air around the house. They come in lots of different sizes from one ton for us up to three tons, four tons, we, you know, depending on which section of our uh, product complement any situation. So they can get pretty large. These can be used just in a, in a, in a normal situation. If you have a house that um, has a, an old gas furnace and an old air conditioning unit, you can directly replace this in its place and have a high performance heat pump for, for all your situations. With that, you can also see the ceiling mounts that are beside that. Those come in different configurations whether they're two by two and you'd have to box out your ceiling joists to accommodate that. The, the most common one is in that ceiling mount box in the top right has now become very popular for us is the um, Easy Fit. And that's a ceiling cassette that goes into your ceiling and fits on traditional 16 inch joist spacing. So it's become extremely popular for us because some consumers really didn't want to see a wall hung you know, on a wall that was a focal wall for them. Um, and instead, we use this, and the contractor for retrofit or new construction can use this as like a zone specific, or it's it's ductless unit, no ductwork, but a really good zone uh, application for it. Then we have the floor mount, again a, a point source like the ceiling mount, uh, and it can be get used in lots of situations. Um, sometimes a high wall doesn't work, sometimes a ceiling mount doesn't work, so you have a floor mount. Uh, and again, all these units are heating and cooling. Uh, and then we also have the horizontal ducted, and these have become even more popular uh, for us in con new construction as we can design better as these are about the size of uh, a suitcase. Uh, they can be put up in the top of a closet or the top of a laundry room or put in the attic. And they come in very small sizes up to very you know large sizes of tonnages. So they really can be used as, as, as zoning. When you go below that to the wall mounts, you'll see lots of different choices there. Um, we have whether they're the colored version, the center, which is, is popular designer series, and then diff just different versions of our you know, high performance or hyperheat or non-hyperheat 
So there's different versions there, um, but all those are pretty much the what we consider the wall mount. We know that the more ductwork you have, usually the more problematic things can be. First, you have to design it right. Second, it has to be installed right. And third, you have to make sure that someone doesn't mess it up as they're, the trades are coming through finishing up the house. The last thing is with long or large complex duct systems, you have the problems for air imbalances. And as people use their house differently, some people close their doors, all their doors when they're not using it, then you can have air imbalances. So, so when we look at how we design, we, we try to use smaller runs of duct, more units in the house than just one giant system. And this will allow us, I think, a, a lot more flexibility to design the house properly than you would with a traditional single stage system. And with that, um, we have to understand if we are using ductwork, how it's designed, what type of diffusers that we're using, because again, that can have a really big impact on the comfort level, how air is distributed, the stratification of the air, as Kimberly said, how you actually feel. It can be a lot more complex than some people think when you're designing a proper HVAC system. So I've mentioned variable capacity, you know, how it works with our systems. The reason this technology is interesting is that unlike a traditional heat pump or um, air conditioning system, you can have really problems with not only comfort, but also with the ability to remove moisture if your system is what we call short cycling. And that means it's not running long enough to remove enough moisture. So there's lots of things that with the new variable speed systems that we can really show that's a much better system, much more beneficial system for, for lots of reasons. But again, understand that it works as its compressor, it varies its speed so that it can accommodate the loads of the house and change uh, as needed. One of the things that is really important to understand about how our systems work is pretty much all of our systems come out of the box, that their fan continuously uh, is on. And that's again, very different from a traditional single speed system. Like I said, a single speed system is either on or off and again, causes problems. With our Wahongs or even our ducted models, we like to have the fan in continuous operation, and it does that for several reasons. It can monitor the air uh, temperature as it's passing through the system. Uh, it constantly is distributing the air, so less uh, stratification. It also, at every time it passes through the filter, you're getting, again, one more level of filtration. So whether it's a wall hung or it's a ducted system, fan on is what we think is probably the best in most situations. And again, it offers you better filtration, better comfort, and we don't have to move the air so fast. Uh, so you don't have that blast, that loud sound of air blowing out of your vents for two or three minutes. Ours is constantly moving and you're never gonna hear it. Now, the air throw of our units, when you think about a ductless unit, and then this is, if you've ever looked at a thermal image, you can probably see this, but what we're just trying to show is that this is the, the, basically the beginning phase of, of throwing air from the wall hung. And it's a very interesting concept of how air moves. Um, Kimberly mentioned the second law of thermodynamics, which is also one of my favorites, uh, because it really lets us understand how air can move throughout a room or even a house. You know, a lot of people will ask us, you know, we have a wall hung uh, on one side of our big living room, will it, will it cool the whole room? And we're like, yeah, absolutely. And there are limitations. Uh, so we have to think about, you know, if our model has a throw of 30 or 40 feet, you really don't want to have a room that's 50 feet long and, and put this unit on one end. So understanding that air will mix and it will come back to the unit and it'll condition it, that is really the concept of air movement, whether it's ductless or even ducted systems. The, the actual air movement is very important because third, second law of thermodynamics basically dictates that air will mix. And so yes, it will get to the other side of your room. It'll certainly go around the hallway a little bit because air just wants to equalize itself in temperature and pressure. So hot spots and cold spots, again, really where Mitsubishi started as the pioneer in the US for, for mini splits was understanding that. And again, that's where it started, but it's certainly evolved uh, a lot more since then. What we really try to do is we are trying to help people design for new systems in existing homes also to eliminate hot spots and cold spots on the design. And as we've said before, um, proper design of the, the system is, is really good and the ductwork is really important. But as you know, Kimberly also said, the envelope, knowing how that works is, is definitely different from a house that is built in say the 70s or 60s or 50s compared to a house that's built today. And when you have a very leaky house, it's gonna, the air moving through your house will be very different than what we consider for a new house or a tighter house today. So the envelopes are important. The systems design is important. 
But one of the biggest things is, is understanding is the load. And if you don't have the proper load calculation, that tells you how much heat or cooling you need for your house, you're pretty much gonna have problems from day one. And what a lot of contractors do, and this is just the way it is, most of them don't really do great load calculations or they don't do, do, do them at all. And now for new construction, yes, they do. They, they're getting much better with that. But a lot of existing uh, homes, you know, the contractor will go and look at the house and see that, okay, that's a, that's a three-ton system, so we're going to replace that with a three-ton system. The problem with that is, is that we know over the years people have upgraded insulation, they've upgraded their windows, uh, they've also added on to a house, or they have changed space so it's no longer an unconditioned attic. Um, so these things really matter. And again, as we start to understand how the air is moving through the house, a load calculation is absolutely, absolutely critical. And uh, HVAC contractor can do that, but also a designer. We use a lot of designers on, on high performance homes because we feel like they really can take the time to do a proper load calculation and let the contractor install it and take that burden off the contractor. But these are all spaces where we have to, all ways that we can avoid hot spots or cold spots. So we will speak very, very briefly on sound, but because we, we do a pretty good job with it, we think uh, we would mention that. Um, our units are extremely quiet. So if you've never been around one of our units, you would be probably pretty surprised how quiet they are. Uh, the indoor unit, unless it's on full fan, you will never hear it. Uh, the outdoor unit, unless it's on you know, max operation, you can stand literally five feet from it and not hear it at all. This is really important for not only the indoor space, uh, but also outside. As more people are staying home, more people are having outdoor living spaces, the outdoor unit being extremely quiet really helps enhance that as a feature for the house and for designers uh, and for builders. Uh, we have lots of builders that talk about this to the consumers and say, we, we use this product and it's a little more expensive, but we use it because it's gonna provide you with an indoor environment that's great and also an outdoor environment that's great. So we really can, I think, hit on that better than most traditional systems ever could. And with that, I'm gonna pass it back over to Kimberly for this next section. Thanks, Chad. So in, in this section, we're gonna address contaminants and humidity controls. And before we do that, we need to consider our contaminants of concern. Um, I'll start by saying that we're of the mindset that it's really important to defer to experts where specialized technical subjects are concerned. So uh, we're not sidestepping the elephant in the room that is COVID, um, but we are going to stick to talking about um, that which we know and which is well within our own wheelhouse of expertise. We know what our pollutants of concern are in irrespective of pathogens. So by addressing the contaminants and pollutants of concern whose nature we understand better, uh, we are necessarily impacting health in, in a positive, effective way, even if it is not directly controlling pathogens or contaminants like uh, COVID. So the pollutant of most concern is PM 2.5, followed closely behind by acrolein. So both PM 2.5 and acrolein are um, combustion byproducts which means that there are both interior and exterior sources of those pollutants. Formaldehyde, we understand to be a real concern as well because it's a known carcinogen. It was, you know, a common binder, sealant um, element in many building materials in the past, and we're seeing that again. And then other VOCs, so acrylene and formaldehyde are also VOCs, but but we'll create a big bucket and put other VOCs into that, that big bucket. So listing these as our contaminants of most concern, let's now break down the methods that we have in our toolkit to address those different contaminants of concern. So the most obvious and the most fundamental contaminant control strategy is don't bring it in in the first place, source control. 
I said combustion sources, so smoking is a source of both PM2.5 and acrolein. Combustion engines, you have a garage, you are going to want to make sure that you air seal that um, barrier between the garage and your living space if you have an attached garage. You don't want to have duct work, especially not um, return duct work in a garage where you know you have a known source of PM2.5 and acrolein. Again, I mentioned combustion byproducts, which means that cooking is another obvious source of these contaminants. So we can't stop cooking, but it's good to know that higher um, heat cooking creates more of these byproducts. Breaking down dilution and elimination, you know, just this example is showing you um, an HRV in action where we're pulling in outside air, it gets filtered before it runs through a heat exchange core, and then it is supplied to an air handler into a supply, it looks like they've got it running to a supply plenum of an air handling unit, and then it gets distributed throughout the house. Concurrently, you're eliminating with this system, so you're you're both supplying air and eliminating contaminants because you're pulling air sometimes from bathrooms, although do that cautiously, and from bedrooms and living rooms. Again, that's going through that same heat exchanger and then being uh, expelled to the outside. So you've got two functions happening at once. Well, in fact, in fact, three because of the filtration element on ERVs and HRVs, there is the necessary result of that filtration that you are likely introducing, in fact, cleaner air from the outside. So compounding the effects of that dilution. And additionally, some ERVs and HRVs have what would be uh, called a recirculation mode. Sometimes that only occurs when the system is in a defrost mode, um, but effectively you are recirculating air within the house, but it's still running through the filter. So let's break down filtration a little bit more. You know, I mentioned that the good news about PM 2.5 is that we have fairly straightforward methods and tools by which we can control PM 2.5 concentrations within our house. And we can just do that by using a high efficacy filter. If you look at this graph here, what you'll see up the y-axis here is the efficiency of removal of these various MERV rated filters and versus on the x-axis, we're describing the range of particle diameter and showing how that overlaps here with the efficacy of different rated filters. So you see a MERV 8, you know, it's pretty good here at 80% efficient at removing particulates that are larger in size. Um, MERV 13, you'll see that it's still quite effective, 80% at removing slightly smaller particle sizes. So actually most PM 2.5 are very well controlled and removed by a MERV 13 filter if it's properly designed. So by properly designed, I am meaning that the face velocity of the air moving through that filter is very important. So if air moves too quickly through a filter, the efficacy of that filter is not as high as if it were moving slower. Um, also, the efficiency of the removal of filters actually increases as the filter loads up with other contaminants. However, it also increases the static resistance within the systems. That's described as a static pressure drop within the duct system. And so it is very important that when you install these higher efficacy filters, that the duct system is properly designed to account for that pressure drop. So I mentioned that filters work better when air is moving more slowly across them. Well, pressure drops are also lower when air is moving more slowly across them. In the case of our ductless systems, this is a question that's coming. It's very relevant <laughs> um, right now. And there are programs that are considering how do we how do we take into 
account the known fact that ductless systems don't have the most effective filters. And so our current best recommendation, given existing solutions, is to consider a whole home filtration fan or an ERV that might have a recirculation mode. It essentially would separate out the duties of space conditioning left to the ductless systems and leave that to an independent system. You know, another solution to this is actually one that could do dual duty, and that would be to have a ducted dehumidifier because these systems not only would enable you to maintain your target humidity level of that 40 to 60 percent between 70 and 75 degrees dry bulb, but it also, if you'll note, you'll see these two round um, collars on the front face of this system. That's actually intended to be a return duct from the interior space. And should you choose to introduce your outdoor air directly, um, that would go through this um, smaller secondary hole or the hole, you know, all of the return could go through this. And then if you look at the bottom, this is the supply um, port. You, you can see the filter there. And most of this style of ducted dehumidifier has an option, if not a default, of a MERV 13 filter. So all of this air coming from the interior house is not only being dehumidified, um, but it's also being filtered. So that is another dual duty system. We use a lot of these systems in conjunction with both ductless and ducted mini splits and multi-zone systems. And with that, Chad, I'm going to hand control back over to you. Thank you, Kimberly. That was fantastic. You touched on so many great things that are so important to uh, designing a healthy, comfortable home. Uh, and I, I think probably a lot of people have a lot of appreciation for the designers that have to look at all of this data and understand all these points because it is it is quite tricky to get things perfect. But it really, once you are working in this field and um, we have some great designers we work with, it, it is definitely uh, easy for them to get it right. But we have to all pay attention to these things to have a, a really good IEQ in our homes and buildings and offices. Um, it, it does it does take consideration. So, so Kimberly, thank you very much and thank all of you for the webinar today. Uh, I think we're ready to start answering some questions and, and hopefully you all enjoyed this. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chad. Thank you, Kimberly. Fantastic presentation. We have a lot of questions and uh, so I think we need to just get started. So can you take us through some of the key points in IQ that uh, an individual would need to, uh, that a builder would want to, um, to make sure sure that they that they address? What are the, the key items to, uh, to that an HVAC designer or contractor would look for? So I think you know, I saw that question. It was more geared to like what what type of designer. You know, it, it, it was more about not the design itself in a house, but more about what they're looking for in a designer. Is that correct, Andy? Yes. Uh, okay. Specifically, yeah. Yep. For, so, uh, so for, for retrofit and so forth. Well, so yeah, for retrofit or new construction, you definitely want a designer who's familiar with uh, a lot of the the newer you know, building science, science concepts. And I know that's always not always the easiest to find. Uh, we do have a lot of designers throughout the U.S. that we can you know lead you towards. So if there's any anybody on the call who wants to us to connect with uh, connect them with um, a designer, we certainly do have plenty of them we work with. Um, and you know, understand the principles. You know, a good designer has been to a lot of the building science um, uh, and the foundational courses and um, different conferences, so they can get a better understanding of how the house works as a system. You know, they, they understand that uh, there needs probably to be more than just one system, mechanical system, uh, not just an HVAC system, but there should be a, a separate ventilation system, maybe a dehumidification system. Um, so there's lots of things that go in there, uh, and they're all integral from, you know, the very beginning of the house process. So if you're looking at a designer, make sure that they've had some experience there and they worked on high-performance projects in the past, uh, because there's a, they're, they're definitely a different build. So... This person says, thank you for emphasizing the limitations of exhaust-only ventilation strategies. And they, they understand the need to shift away from that approach. But they, they like, 
uh, you to elaborate on why. And and since there's another question about exhaust, I want to co combine that with uh, with a separate question, which is you mentioned exhausting from bathrooms and doing that cautiously. Can you elaborate on that as well? Yeah, so they're absolutely related. So so the thing to understand about exhaust only ventilation systems is that they essentially an infiltration on steroid solution. So you're by exhausting, um, actively exhausting air from your house, um, you're depressurizing your your home. And when you, again, when you create those pressure differentials across your building envelope and even between spaces within the home um, or building, you're going to cause air to move from the outside, in this case, to in. And so in some mild climates, um, that might not be a problem. If you don't have humidity loads, that may not be so dangerous. If you don't have, um, if that doesn't cause very cold air to make its way in or very hot air to make its way into your assemblies and into your home. But if you have humidity loads, um, then you that could cause a whole host of problems, not just, um, by virtue of making it more humid and less comfortable inside the building, but because when you pull moisture through a building assembly and you don't know what that pathway looks like, anytime you create um, a combination of humid air hitting a surface that is at or below its dew point temperature, which is not hard to do um, in a humid climate, you create the, that potential to condense water within your building assemblies. And that's actually much more dangerous than getting it all the way inside the house. At least you know that you've got a humid condition. Issues caused by depressurization and pulling humidity loads through building assemblies are often not detected until they become visible, visible problems or people start getting sick. Um, so that's what I meant by that, and that all of those same um, comments apply to some of the questions that were being asked about ventilation loads, and in particular, um, humidity, um, latent ventilation loads, which are really, it's just another way to say humidity loads. Um, you need to, you know, somebody had asked that great question about, well, how do I know, how can I vet a contractor who would be a good candidate for a higher performance building? And and one one way to know would be is whether or not they can talk to you um, intelligently about ventilation and latent loads and about humidity loads. If they already consider that in some way, there isn't a great standardized best practice for how to quantify that. I have my methods and other professionals have their, their methods of doing that, but there's no single best practice. But if you have a contractor who's already thinking about that, and if you're in anything like a humid climate and they're recommending a dehumidifier, that's, that's a good sign. Okay, great. So next question. So there has been, we've, we've talked quite a bit about IEQ and this person says, how can we find performance testing and monitoring information so that builders and HVAC installers know whether these efforts are successful in terms of improving the environment, the, the indoor in environment, and um, creating energy efficiency? Well, I'll, I'll take a quick swing at that, and then Chad, please jump in. Um, the, my first answer is we don't have nearly enough field data um, just generally when it comes to these subjects. So um, so that's something that we certainly can and um, will and should improve upon. Um, that that being said, I'm trying to get to what, what maybe the root <laughs> the root of that question is. Um, have um, have these systems been uh, so variable capacity heat pumps been shown in situ to Im improve energy efficiency and improve um, indoor air quality? Um, in some cases, yes, but it always has to start with 
proper sizing and application of those systems. So the most perfect system um, can perform badly, um, has the same potential to perform poorly as it does to perform really well. So, so key to that is that, you know, key to the success and the high performance of those systems is the proper um, sizing design and application of those systems. And when that occurs, then yes, those systems can improve for low energy costs, can um, aid in improving indoor air quality through really um, low energy um, continuous filtration um, and increased energy efficiency due to the um, high efficiency um, compressors and fans that are in those systems. Okay, next question. So we have an attendee who plans to build a 2,000 square foot house on the North Carolina coast. There will be a very low heating requirement, but lots of cooling and constant high humidity. What would we consider as required for air quality and what would be optional depending upon the budget? Mm -hmm. Well, for, for coastal, you know, for humid coastal regions, uh, my family's all from Florida, um, born and bred. And, um, you know, I remember our beach houses, um, some of the older beach houses um, along the, the Atlantic coast. And, you know, the first thing you do right is to design the house right, because there's a lot that you can get really far into a season and be comfortable um, by just designing well. And because you know that your con your humidity loads are continuous um, pretty much throughout the year, um, those building assemblies and the building materials that you use um, are really important. You want to keep bulk water loads off of as much of your building envelope as possible so that, you know, you're not inadvertently um, dealing with, um, you know, leaks when you, it, that may show up as, you know, higher uh, elevated humidity levels within the house. So that's like the basic thing. But you also want to, you know, you want to provide for as much um, fresh air as possible because when you think about it, um, if you get your shading right, and if you have great ceiling fans, you can coast a lot of the year without having to have active heating and cooling, at which point you are cooling, I'll say in particular, at which point, you know, when, when it does get hotter and you want to close off the house, um, you're, you're, you're going to, if that building is tight, it's like you're going to have a system that intentionally introduces fresh air, right? So remember, the fresh air is is usually um, the thing that we're trying to introduce for for um, for dilution purposes, and then we, as mentioned before, we also want to eliminate pollutants. In a coastal region like that, you know, I wouldn't bother with an ERV, but I would consider a ventilating dehumidifier. So if you did, in fact, need to actively bring in some supply air that you had the option of dehumidifying that as well. So yeah, sidestep the ERV in that case probably. Um, sorry to our ERV partners, but I think they would tend to agree with me there. And um, consider um, consider uh, ventilating dehumidifier as a great option. Uh, Kimberly, I'll add real quick to that. And, and with the use of the, and I was going to recommend the same thing for uh, ventilating the humidifier. And you can, you know, because I think part of the IAQ, IEQ equation is you can add an advanced filter, um, HEPA filters, some of the ventilating dehumidifiers have filter box available for that. So you do get another level of advanced filtration before it even gets in the house. Um, but I, I concur with Kimberly in most coastal uh, situations with. Um, with the way we're building today, a dehumidifier is, is almost a must. Um, we've all been in beach houses before and been very, the temperature has been very cold, but we still feel kind of clammy. Uh, and that's because the air conditioner cannot do enough with all of the existing moisture to, to dry the house out. Okay. Looks like we're running a little bit over, but um, I think we have so many questions. We're going to get a few more in before um, before we wrap up. Um, let me ask this one question. So, ventilation 
for this attendee causes major problems when trying to uh, re reduce loads to make um, an HPV. And this is an observation based on a lot of their projects. So what would be some ways to potentially reduce ventilation loads? Well, an ERV is, well, first of all, I would say make sure that you're not overventilating. So that's one, like make sure that the you've got enough ventilation, but not too much. And you, you can use 622 or look up passive house requirements for ventilation um, or, you know, another green building program for what that ventilation rate should be. Um, so start there. And then the system that, you know, will help uh, reduce both the sensible, so the heat, heating or cooling, and the latent loads would be an ERV, so an enthalpy or energy recovery ventilator. Um, where humidity is concerned, you know, it's very important to realize that the even when latent recovery efficiencies are high for ERVs, those ratings are um, for very low temperatures. So that that rating is not necessarily useful um, for more mild and humid climates. Um, and if you are in a humid climate, like in any of the Gulf Coast or um, even up through the mid-Atlantic and um, sometimes around other bodies of water, lake, lake areas, um, you may, um, you may need a, well, sorry, you will need to consider those, those humidity loads separately because the ERV will only reduce at more moderate temperatures something like 50% of that load. So if that load starts out pretty high, 50% reduction of that ventilation load may not be enough in some cases. Well, this next question is somewhat related. Um, can a ducted mini split be combined with an HRV or ERV? How would they be integrated? Chad, do you want to take that one? Sure, and they definitely can. Um, you know, we've had, and it's not just for a ducted solution. We we've had houses that have been all ductless with an ERV that um, certainly works uh, very well um, if you have the right placement of ductless. But for ducted, certainly we would um, we integrate with ERVs, HRVs, um, ventilating dehumidifiers, and you know, there's obviously lots of different ways to do that. And I guess. The question for us is most of the time that we have is the control side of that. And, you know, we probably will do a part two of this and then we will go into, that was the idea is to go into more of the technical, uh, maybe the actual layouts and controls of this. Here's one example of a, a passive house um, located in the Dallas-Fort Worth area um, where um, this was a certified passive house through PHI. Um, where we've got a combination of ducted mini splits. Um, the SCC is our low static unit, PADs are, are the, the mid static unit, um, along with a Zender Compo Air 350, which is a very high efficiency ERV, and an in wall um, dehumidifier by um, Ultra Air. So this is a 33 pints per day um, non ducted dehumidifier. Um, let me see if I've got the controls pulled up. Now, I'm afraid that for the, you know, Chad's right that, that controls are often the piece that don't get addressed enough and we haven't done that here. And I think it uh, would be a great idea to have a follow-up session where we show some of the int integration controls options. We are, you know, we can integrate with uh, Google Home and Alexa and, Nest thermostats, um, along with any host of the higher higher end um, um, building automation systems that you know, like a crush drawn. Um, so those Thank options do do exist. Yes. Real, real quick, I yeah. one of the questions I think is for a ducted system that people have a lot, and you can see in the Zenders is definitely a decoupled system versus you know one solution. So I think that that is probably a really Probably a big question is, you know, when people ask about our mini splits, they're, you know, ducted, they're like, can you dump your, you know, your ERV air into your, you know, your mini split ductwork? 
you know, will that work? Can you control the fan of your, you know, mini split? I mean, those types of questions are, you know, if we have a decoupled system uh, like the Zender with it's completely separate systems, that's one thing. But I think maybe some of the questions that I've had have been about a, a singular system where the uh, ERV is connected to our ductwork. Do you want to address that? Um, sure. So, right. The sender system is totally independent and its ductwork is independent. So these are, this is decoupled. Um, but we, uh, you know, often have applications where a ducted um, ERV or HRV is, and the ventilating dehumidifiers are, they, they pull their return air independently or, sh or should, and, but the supply air from those systems gets integrated into the supply side of a, an, a, another duct system. So I don't know how easily, easily we can, you can see this, but you would integrate a supply um, from a, an ERB into a supply plenum um, that was feeding your high traffic areas, your bedrooms, well, in particular, and, and maybe your living spaces. In terms of controls, um, it depends. There are options for, um, we have a, I don't know if we want to get into controls right now, but we do have options for integrating um, those systems so that the air handler can respond um, to um, different inputs from um, from controllers or sensors. Well, thank you, Chad and Kimberly, for your expertise and a fantastic presentation. Also, thank you to our attendees for all of your great questions. You've asked much more than we can answer during this session, but we will follow up with you and um, hopefully we can uh, provide some clarity and insight. Also, maybe address more on the uh, in part two when we get to that. Uh, I'd like to um, turn it over to to Justin Frank, our editorial director, and uh, has some closing remarks. Thanks, Andy. Uh, just wanted to again thank everybody for coming. Um, thank Mitsubishi for for being our partners in this webinar and for providing such great information. And for those of you who came in a few minutes late, just a reminder that you will be getting. Uh, an email link to this recording uh, via the registration email that you used to get into the webinar. Um, and with that, thank you guys for coming and uh, we'll see you for the next one. Thanks, Justin. Thank you.